Hello everyone, I am Manika and in today's module we will learn about the concept of production costs. Suppose a firm that produces clothes is required to increase its output in the next year. How would it go about it? Perhaps they will hire more workers or increase the raw material in the form of textiles, threads and dyes. They may also have to increase the number of machines or the water and electricity required to produce the extra clothes now. Therefore, an increase in output would require more expenditure by the firm. Economists call these expenses on factor inputs like land, labor, raw materials and fuel as cost of production. We know that a firm always tries to maximize its profits. This is its only objective. One way in which the firm can do this is by trying to minimize the costs of production. Economists consider this ability of the firm to maximize the profit while minimizing the cost as efficiency. But what are the different kinds of costs a firm has to incur? Let us take another example. Suppose a farmer decides to become a flour mill owner. She will need a machine to turn the wheat into flour a building to store all the wheat, which is the raw material, as well as electricity and workers to manage the mill. These inputs were bought by the mill owner through money and these are called the explicit costs. The money spent on renting land and the building, hiring workers, buying raw materials, power and other overhead expenditures are called explicit cost. Let us take the explicit cost to be 25,000 rupees and the total revenue earned by the mill owner as 40,000 rupees. An accountant may calculate the profit of the mill owner to be 15,000 rupees. How did we get this number? We subtracted 25,000 rupees, that is the explicit cost of buying inputs, or what we also call the accounting cost, from the total revenue of 40,000 rupees. But economists find this calculation incomplete. They recognize that there is an opportunity cost that is missing. Opportunity cost can also be termed as implicit cost. The mill owner, who was earning 10,000 rupees before as a farmer, is now missing out on that farm income. Therefore, when economists calculate the profits for the mill owner, they will also take the extra 10,000 rupees of that lost opportunity or implicit cost into account. So we have a new concept now, the economic cost, which is equal to explicit cost incurred on various factor inputs and implicit cost, which is the opportunity cost. This opportunity cost could also be for other factor inputs and not just from the labor from farming. If instead of using the land for the flour mill, it was used instead by the farmer for a grocery shop, it might have earned some money as rent. This lost income is also an opportunity cost. Whatever be the decision of the farmer to be a mill owner or not, she will have to take both the explicit cost of hiring workers and raw materials, as well as the implicit cost of losing out on the farm income or the rental income from grocery shop into account. Another way to think about these costs is in terms of the money and real costs. What is money cost? Money cost of production are all the expenses incurred by the firm to hire, land, labor, capital and raw materials. And what is real cost? Real cost of production will include all the money costs of the expenses incurred by the firm as well as the implicit costs of the alternate uses of land, labor, or any other inputs self-supplied by the firm. Now let us solve the following question. A firm ABC is producing shirts. Various operational business expenditures are as follows. Power per annum is rupees 5,000. Cost of fabric is rupees 10,000. The salaries for the workers is rupees 8,000. Direct and indirect overhead expenses is rupees 10,000 again. The company is not paying any rent on the land as it is owned by the entrepreneur of the firm. If this land had been rented out, the entrepreneur would have earned a rent of rupees 20,000 per annum. 
Now pause the video and consider what are the money and real costs for this firm. Here the money cost will be rupees 33,000 after adding the power charges, cost of fabric, salaries, direct and indirect overhead expenses. On the other hand, real cost is rupees 35,000 obtained after adding the rent, which the building belonging to the promoter would have earned in the outside market and the money cost of doing business. But enough about costs for the moment. Let us talk about profits. From our previous discussion, we know of two kinds of profits. Accounting profit, which is equal to the total revenue, minus the accounting cost, which is the explicit cost of doing business, such as hiring workers and buying raw materials. Second, the economic profit, which is equal to total revenue, and you subtract from that the sum of the accounting cost and the opportunity cost, which is the implicit cost which is indirectly borne by the firm. But there is another kind of profit which is important for the firm to consider whether or not to stay in business at all. Economists call it normal profit. Normal profits are the minimum profit an entrepreneur needs to earn to continue in business. In other words, without this minimum profit, the entrepreneur will have to stop this business and move to some other industry. We could also think of normal profits as an opportunity cost of entrepreneurship. Normal profits are included in the opportunity cost or the implicit cost of production. Therefore, normal profits are also a part of the economic cost or the total cost of a firm. Through most of this module, we have been only talking about the costs incurred by the firm. But what about the social cost of producing? Let us now talk about private and social costs. Let me give you an example. Suppose a garment factory uses colors and dye in its production process. It releases these byproducts and waste in the nearby river. This polluted water causes damages for people living downstream who use this water for domestic and agricultural purpose. Economists also calculate these costs when taking the decision regarding production. We know that the firm incurs actual expenses like cost of raw material, wages, overhead expenses, etc. But these are the private cost of the firm. In other words, these are the costs that are borne privately by the firm. But the damage that is caused to the water by the firm's production is the external cost of production. We add this external cost to the private cost to get the social cost of production. Social cost is equal to private cost plus the external cost in the form of the damages to the society. Let us now come back to the costs of the firm. Every firm incurs two kinds of costs, fixed cost and variable cost. Let's come back to our flour mill example. Now the machine used in the mill is a fixed input because it does not matter if you produce zero or thousand kilos of flour, you will need this machine. The cost of buying this machine in some senses is your fixed cost, formally called the total fixed cost. Other examples of these costs are the rent of the factory, interest on past borrowings or salaries of any permanent employee such as a manager. But there are other inputs that are also required in production. Some of these inputs change directly with the change in the level of output. So if you increase your production from 500 kilos to 1000 kilos, you will require more electricity. You will also require more laborers and raw materials. In economics, we refer to these as the variable costs of production. Fixed cost refers to the expenditure on fixed inputs which are incurred independent of the level of output produced. Variable cost refers to the expenditure on variable inputs, which vary with the change in the level of output. Therefore, it is possible for a firm to incur zero variable cost if it produces zero output, but it would still incur the cost of fixed input. Now let us talk about total cost of the firm. Obviously, we get the total cost of a firm by adding the total fixed costs and total variable costs 
which are incurred in producing a given amount of output. Symbolically, we qualify this total cost as equal to total fixed cost and the total variable cost. Let us now add the concept of time to costs. Let us talk about short run costs and long run costs of doing business. In our mill example, if we wish to increase output in a short period of time, we can only do so by hiring more laborers, buying more raw material and increasing the power supply. In other words, through an increase in the variable inputs, the firm is not able to change all factor inputs in the very short run. For example, buying another machine or plant would require more planning perhaps a loan for the purchase, and it cannot be done in a short period of time. Therefore, short run costs basically consist of both fixed costs and variable costs. In the long run, however, the firm is able to change all its factor inputs. Thus, all costs are variable costs. There are no fixed costs in the long run. Let us now talk about another concept of cost, marginal cost. Marginal cost is the change in the total cost for every extra unit of output that is produced. One way to look at it is this, that it captures the change in total variable cost with the change in output. Symbolically, marginal cost is equal to delta TVC divided by delta Q, where delta is change, TVC is the total variable cost, and Q is the output that is produced. For example, if producing additional bags of flour requires hiring one new worker, then the marginal cost of the additional flour includes the cost of hiring another worker because the fixed cost remains constant even if you produce an extra bag of flour. The only change in the total cost is due to total variable costs. Let us take a hypothetical schedule of costs. Can you solve the following table for the missing costs? We can pause the video for the calculations and I will discuss the answers. We know TC is equal to TVC and TFC. So for the first unit of output, 10 rupees of TVC plus 20 of TFC gives us 30 of total cost. What about the MC? For the second unit of output, we divide the change in TVC that is 18 minus 10, which is 8, by the change in quantity, which is 1. Therefore, our MC is equal to 8. You can now calculate rest of the table similarly. Let us now discuss the graphical representation of our cost concepts. The first is total fixed cost. We know that total fixed cost remains constant even at different levels of output and can never be zero even if there is no output being produced currently. Therefore, the total fixed cost curve will be plotted on the graph. Let us try and plot this. We plot output or quantity on the x-axis and costs on the y-axis. We can see in the figure that the total fixed cost curve will be a line parallel to the x-axis. Therefore, you would incur a fixed cost constantly, whether you were producing zero output or one or two, so on and so forth. Total variable cost. We know that these costs vary with the amount of output that is produced. Graphically, the total variable cost curve initially increases at a falling rate and after a certain point, it increases continuously. Why does this happen? Look at the figure. This is the total variable cost curve. The TVC curve behaves this way due to the law of variable proportions to a factor. Initially, the firm increases the level of output by increasing its variable factor and the benefits from increasing returns. That is, the output increases at a faster rate in comparison to the increase in input. To go back to the flour mill example, by adding one additional worker, 
the firm is able to increase its output by more than one unit of flour. This phase continues till a certain point, after which the addition of wearable input, in our example, the worker, does not lead to enough of an increase in the output. This is the point of inflection. Beyond this point, diminishing returns to the factor come into play. Suppose you go on increasing the number of workers in the mill, but the number of flour machines stay constant. Soon there will be too many workers in proportion to the machines, and the gain that was initially made by adding workers will start to decline. Therefore, a firm cannot go on increasing its output continuously by only increasing one input factor endlessly. Sooner or later, the restriction of not being able to increase all factor inputs in the short run mean the output stops increasing with increase in use of just one input. Now let us look at the figure of the total cost curve. As we know, total cost is the sum of the total variable cost and the total fixed cost. Therefore, graphically, the total cost curve is just a vertical summation of TFC and TVC at a given level of output. You will notice that the TC curve and the TVC curve are parallel to each other. This is because the TFC curve, which is the difference between the TVC and TC curve, is constant for all levels of output. Now let us look at the marginal cost curve. Let me remind you something about the relationship between production and cost. When marginal product increases due to increasing returns, the corresponding marginal cost decline. Similarly, when marginal product decreases, the marginal cost increases. We can see from the graph that the marginal cost curve first declines to a point and then begins to rise. Why does this happen? We will have to look at the relationship between the TVC and MC curves for this. Let us look at the relationship between these curves graphically. Recall that marginal cost is the difference in total variable cost of two consecutive units of output. As we can see from the graph, the MC curve declines till a point as the TVC initially increases at a decreasing rate. The MC is lowest at this point, beyond which the law of variable proportions or diminishing returns starts to apply. Now the TVC curve begins to increase at an increasing rate and corresponding to this, the MC also begins to rise. We can also look at this in the following way. Suppose we want to find out the TVC till a particular unit of output, Q. We can calculate TVC by adding up the MC up to this level of output, that is the area under the MC curve. In summary, cost in economics refers to the expenses that are incurred by a firm in the process of production. Explicit cost refers to the cash payments which are made to buy inputs. Opportunity cost is the value of next best alternative that is given up. Implicit costs are the opportunity cost of the self-owned inputs. These also include the normal profits. We call economic cost as the sum of all explicit and implicit costs. We know that short run is a time period in which a firm cannot change all the inputs. Output can be increased only by increasing variable inputs and therefore variable costs. The cost of fixed inputs remains unchanged in the short run. Long run is a time period in which a firm can change all factor inputs and thus change in level of output. Thus all costs are variable costs. Total cost is the summation of total fixed cost and total variable cost. TFC curve is the horizontal line parallel to x-axis because TFC is fixed or constant for all levels of output. It can never be zero even when no output is being produced because the firm has to bear some fixed cost on these independent of the production. The shape of TVC is an inverse S which means initially variable costs increase at a decreasing rate and after some point that is the point of inflection, it increases at an increasing rate. 
due to law of variable proportions or returns to a factor. The total cost curve is shaped similar to the total variable cost curve, that is both are upward sloping parallel curves. The TC curve is a vertical summation of TFC and TVC curves. This implies that at zero output, TC is equal to TFC because there are no variable costs. After that, every change in TC is entirely due to the change in TVC. The MC curve is a U-shaped curve which corresponds to the TC and TVC curves. It declines initially till a point and then begins to rise. With this, we conclude our session on costs. Thank you for listening to us.